the place. Uh, if you want a starting point, Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to go ahead and say a prayer over this, and then we'll get right into the word. Lord, we just ask a blessing on this conversation that we're going to have about your word. I pray that we would hear what the Spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, which I'm not asking you to turn there, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, we have in a kind of an interesting moment in the life of Israel, which pretty much the entire Old Testament is a conversation about the life of Israel. And in that chapter, we have a really that a watershed moment of Israel's history. And prior to that, they had been led by judges, um, individuals raised up to help them overcome other nations that had been had brought uh, them into subjugation and slavery. And, and just before this moment of chapter 7, we have that they were being led by uh, the priest Eli, who had two sons, and those sons were, uh, were, were, were corrupt. They were religious, but they weren't godly. And there is a difference. And as a result, uh, the nation um, was not being governed correctly. And you know, whenever a nation isn't being governed correctly, it is a reflection just as much upon the nation and the people that is on the leaders. We always look to the leaders, but in the end, it's, it, they're a reflection of the, of the nation, and so it was with Israel. Israel uh, was being very unwise. They were not worshiping God and following the Lord. They were worshiping many gods, and they were practicing do, uh, religious practices that were not taught in the law. And, and, and in the end, God raised up the Philistines, a neighboring nation, and subjugated them. And what even matters worse is that the central point of their identity as a nation and as, their, as of their faith, the, what was called the Ark of the Covenant, which was a piece of furniture, if you'd want to say, in their tabernacle that is where God spoke to them in the Old Testament. Of course, we don't hold to that now because God, Christ is uh, now made it possible. He speaks to us in, you know, directly through the Holy Spirit and his word. But then it was, it was done from the Ark of the Covenant and through prophets. And they took it. Well, it didn't go so well for the Philistines. They eventually sent it back, and it ended up um, in a place called kirath Jerem, And it stayed there for 20 years. Actually, it said it stayed there a long time for 20 years. So it, it wasn't just 20 years. It just felt like a really, really long 20 years because it was a difficult a humiliating time for Israel. And during that time, the Bible says that they got rid of all of their pagan stuff and focused on God and they worshiped God and they sought to obey him. But yet Lord left them in that place um, of difficulty. And about 20 years had passed and Samuel now was the prophet and he also the priest and he spoke uh, to Israel and they began to come together and worship and in one particular time, they'd gathered together to do worship and to sacrifice before God. And, and there, it was obvious a new season had dawned upon Israel, a new leadership, a new season where they were going to follow God. And the Philistines heard about it and sent an army to subjugate the Israelites again. And the Israelites, with Samuel's direction, called upon the Lord. And God created a confusing, brought confusion to the Philistines, and the Israelites routed them. And they came back and they worshipped God after that battle. And, and Samuel, it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, that he brought, got a big stone, and he called it an Ebenezer stone, which means thus far has the Lord helped us. I was been gone for the last couple weeks, as as I usually do at the end of the summer, to take. Uh, it's great to just shut the phone off, and I actually do, I do shut my phone off. I don't actually turn it on for three weeks, and and it was very healthy for our family, especially in this season. As many of you have over the years, some of you recently, 
Some of you, it's been a while. Some it's kind of come at some point where one of your children, maybe your oldest child like mine, Rachel, finally graduates high school, and now we are spending the last week or so with her, and then we took her down to California during that time and dropped her off at Life Pacific College in San Dimas. And some of you have experienced that in different ways. Some, maybe, like my dad, he experienced they dropping me off at the MEP station to go off to the military. Some, some experienced it in a, that they moved out and got a job, or whatever happened that it, it marked a new season of your life, and so it did with us. We took Rachel down, had a great uh, uh, visit with her as we, in the last week uh, here in Squim. And as we went down and just pondering the years of, of, of really the privilege of us really wanting, as any parent, wanting to raise your children the right way so that they would make great choices and follow, ultimately as a Christian, the most important thing is that they would follow the Lord. More than any personal success and in any occupation, that they would want to follow God as being a kind of the, the root of our desire for our children and you know, coming here and, and squim when Rachel was uh, one year old and, you know, and then taking her down and now she's 18, soon to be 19 years old. And, and we went, we arrived at Life Pacific College, which is our four square college, uh, went through uh, a couple days of orientation. They did an absolutely outstanding job of, of just, you know, some of those uh, meetings were long, but they were important where they explained the different departments and how things worked and as parents, we were pleased to hear them say to these young adults, you know, this is not summer camp, and this is not your youth group. <laughs> uh, at the same token, and oh, by the way, we're not going to call your parents for the bill. We're going to call you. We all love that one. And, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, that, that, the, the practical realities of, of that was really healthy, but we, even more so just watching them care for these young students, young adults, now freshmen coming in, and, and really wanting them to know that they were cared for, not just that they were there to be students. That they, and, and just watching how they were integrating them in for those two days. And we ended, we had several meals together, and we ended finally uh, with this chapel service. And this chapel service of which they, we worshiped together, and the word of the Lord was brought, and then, um, and then we, uh, they had the kids pray. For, we prayed for the, our children. The children prayed for the parents. And at the end of the service, the, the, they got up and said, okay, parents, it's now time for you to leave. And uh, so we parents got up. And, uh, and that, as, we, as we were preparing to leave, they said, you know, we had, and it was part of the service, but they had these stones at the front of the, of the, of the, of the sanctuary. And they, they encouraged us to come up and, and as we left to get a stone. And I picked up this particular stone. And, and this particular stone had a verse on it. It's 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. And that's my story this last week. We all have stories. You have a story that maybe you have something happening in your life. And if you took time in this service, we probably could spend uh, you know, half the day hearing some really powerful and great stories of what God is speaking to you in your life and doing. We all love stories. You know, we love to, some of us love to read stories. Some of us love to watch stories. But all of us are experience, experiencing stories in our lives. We all love to listen to stories in some form. Did you know that we serve and worship the greatest storyteller in history? You know, a, a determining factor of uh, a great storyteller is a couple thousand years later, his, their, story is still, their stories are still being told, which is the case with Jesus. You know, my stories will be told maybe once or twice in a given year and then most likely forgotten, as yours is most of us. But Jesus' stories have been told again and again and again and again. This next season we're going into on Sunday morning, we're going to be looking at the stories of Christ. 
I use the word stories because that's what they are. Now, the Bible calls them parables. For someone who's been raised in church, who reads the Bible often, I can hear the word parable, and I would, I would understand what that means. But some people who may be new to the Christian faith, if you say the word parable, they're going to think it's, it's like some kind of medication. You know? A parable is a story that is laid alongside to compare to a spiritual truth. That is what a parable is. It's a story. We're going to talk about You know, Jesus was a master storyteller. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 says, Then he told them many things in parables or stories. What story is Jesus telling you right now in your life? For me, it, it was this journey of this last couple, couple weeks. When Jesus tells a story, we can count on a couple things, both as we look at the parables or the stories of Christ in the New Testament. There's over 56 of them. We'll probably... We won't cover all of them, but we're going to look at many of them. When we look at them, there's a couple things that we can can say that will help us understand the stories of Christ. But the same principles that I'm going to give you also apply to wanting to understand the story that is happening in your own life. The first thing is when we look at the stories of Christ or the parables of Christ, Um, there's a point. There is a reason the story is being told. Now, I'm going to back up a little bit because Job chapter 33, verse 14 says that God does speak now one way or another through man, though a man may not perceive it. It is my hope that you will want to perceive that the Lord is speaking to you, both through what this, 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 sermon, but more importantly, through what he's speaking through your own experience. But when he tells a story, there's a point. For me, that whole story about me dropping my daughter off, there's a lot in that. In the end, it, the point was the Lord helped us, has thus far helped us. He got us to this point. For me, that was the point of all the discernment of that moment. For you, what are you going through right now? What's the point? Not the point in the negative sense. What is the, re- what is the Lord saying to you in the midst of this? Because he's talking. But are you perceiving it? To understand a, p- a parable, we need to listen to the story. We need to listen. I think oftentimes what we'll do is when we look at the parables or the stories of Jesus in the New Testament, some people get way too detailed about it. They get... I mean, they get... They want to sparse it out till it's like dissecting a frog. And they miss the main point. What a great example of that. And we'll be looking, we might be looking at this one in the, in the several weeks from now in Matthew 25 about the story of the, of the ten virgins. Where there were ten virgins waiting for the uh, bridegroom to come. And ten, they all had lamps and five, the, the, the oil ran out and five, the oil didn't run out. And then the bridegroom showed up and, you know, they were gone trying to find, the five that didn't have were gone trying to find uh, oil. And then the five that had it were off and going with, with the bridegroom. And then, well, you, you look at that parable, and I've got to be honest, I've been around church a long time, how many people will sparse that thing out? When they, and most of the time they're trying to figure out who are the five that didn't have the oil. And the fact is, is the point of that parable is, 
be ready. <laughs> Not figure out what you don't have, but be ready. <laughs> and what happens, and that's what happens, is people get caught up in the minors and not focusing on the majors. Major in the majors, not major in the minors. In other words, what is the point that the Lord is telling us over? That's what he wants us to hear. Now, do I think there are other things in, that are spoken in those stories? Yes. There are different aspects and details of the story that can bring forth some truth that can be very helpful to us and freeing to us. We see that when we read the Bible every time. You read a story in the Bible or a passage of Scripture, and you've read it you know, several times over the years, and then all of a sudden you read it and you go, I never saw that before. And it just speaks to your heart. Well, that's the Holy Spirit bringing something alive to you at the moment. But in the end, there's a point. You don't want to miss the point. Instead, Ultimately, that point is intended to lead us to some type of response, change, or action. When Jesus tells a story or a parable, there's a point. When Jesus tells a story or a parable, there is a kingdom truth to be known. You'll see this in several of the parables or stories of Jesus where he'll say, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like this. And then he lays out this story so that we would understand the truth of the king, a truth of the kingdom. Now, the purpose that Jesus does this this way, I think is twofold. One, and I think is, I think often by people who perceive themselves as being more mature believers, um, will tend to diminish what I'm about to say. Some Jesus spoke in parables because that was, it's often easier, I mean, it's easy for people to consume a story. They can listen to it, they can, it captures their attention. And it's the way the young, both in age and character of faith, can consume a truth. And that's okay. The other reason, which is really the more challenging reason, is he is trolling, and I'll use fishing terms, trolling for the willful, the willing. What do I mean by that? Well, we have here in Matthew chapter 13, he tells the story or the parable of the sower, the farmer going out and casting seed. And he tells this, this story. And the crowd leaves, and the disciples come back to him and say, why are you teaching us this way? Why are you telling us stories? We want to get into the nitty-gritty of things. We want to get down to the nuts and bolts. That's Mike's translation. That's what he says in chapter 13, verse 10. He says, why do you do this? And then he said to him, this, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. He goes on and says, in verse 13, he says, uh, you know, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though they see, they do not see. Though they hear, they do not under, hear or understand. And then verse 14, he goes on and says, uh, in, in them, that being the stories that I'm giving, fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah. You will, never be, you, you, will, uh, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, ever seeing but never perceiving. For God, for the people's hearts become callous, otherwise they have condensed it, hear and see, and understand their hearts in turn, and I will heal them. You initially read that, and you're wondering, okay, Jesus, so basically you're saying, I'm just not going to tell them, because then they would actually... Him. That's what it seems like what he's saying. The fact is, is that if you look at the way Jesus looks at people throughout the rest of the New Testament, he doesn't want anyone. He wants all to come to him. 
So why would he say this? It seems like he's telling stories to keep people in the dark and prevent them from repenting. But it only seems that way. You see, many people want to hear about salvation, how happy it will be in heaven. They want to hear the privileges that we have as believers. But they really don't want to change. Have you ever been in a room full of people such as this? This is a, I mean, I, I'm about to describe something and I am guilty as charged. You're in a room full of people and you're having a conversation with somebody and you're talking to them. And as you're talking to them, you're noticing that they are looking past you. And they're, I, maybe you're like me. I, I mean, I love that movie Up, but I'm like that dog, Doug, who hears, sees a squirrel from over here, you know? I mean, easily distracted. So I have to literally, when I'm talking to someone, force myself to look at them, stop, look, and listen. Because if I don't purposely do that, I'm easily distracted. Well, there are people who do that all the time. They're so ingrained that they, they will... They will list, look like they're listening to you, but you know they're looking at something else. Maybe it's you. Let me know what I'm talking about. You all felt that? Probably felt that in this room. Kingsway is full of people. You know, it's not a perfect place. Okay? That's what this is talking about. Jesus is saying, they're listening to me, but they're really not listening. They're not perceiving what I'm saying. Now you are. He says that to his disciples. You are. And the point is, is that not only, did, the, the fact is, is that these people that weren't listening, they were just adding to their voluntary blindness. And what the Lord was trying to fish for was people that were truly interested in knowing. So he would tell a story, hoping that they would come and do what the disciples did and ask, what does this mean? And there it is. The reason Jesus talks to us in stories is so that we'll ask questions, that we will seek, that we'll be attracted to know. Once the crowds had left, the disciples stayed. They wanted to be taught. And hear this. When they asked, an explanation was given. It was given. So for us that are growing in the Lord, you come to Kingsway, and maybe some of you have reached a place in your life where you've, you know, you've, you've turned the corner in your, in your walk with Christ. And you're wondering what's next. Maybe you've, you've recently decided to follow the Lord. Or you've recently decided to say, you know what, I'm going to get serious with the Lord, but now what do I do? You know, you need to put yourself in a place where you can ask some questions. One of which is either our Operation Solid Life class that's taking place on Wednesday nights, or our home fellowships. Maybe you're in a place where you have the stirring of wanting to do something for the Lord to share your faith, but you don't know how. Well, just don't let it bottle up. Start asking the question, how do I do that? That's where our Contagious Christian class is coming up on Wednesday nights. It's, it's very similar to what the disciples did here with Jesus. They took the next step once the crowd had dispersed and came and took the time to be taught further. That's ultimately what Jesus does when he tells a story. He is leading us to a place where we'll put ourselves in the position to ask more questions and discover more. The third thing, and 
final thing that happens here is when Jesus tells a story, there's a point, there's a kingdom truth, but it's a kingdom truth that is found in the Bible. I always like to say, if you want to understand what Jesus is saying now in the story, understand what he said already. And not only true in our own story experience, but also in the experience of looking at, at the problem of the parables. We see in this Matthew passage, we have the parable of the sower, the story of the sower, but also an explanation of why he's doing, a partial explanation of why he's doing that. And he references the Bible. That's in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, when he says, Go and tell these people, be ever hearing, never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. He is, he's basically saying, the reason I'm doing this was prophesied on before. In Psalm 78, we have the psalmist prophesying about the way Jesus would teach. When he says in Psalm 78, I will open my mouth in parables or stories, and I will, hit, I will utter hidden things from, the old, from old. If you read that whole Psalms, he's basically, it's, it's not only a, a prophecy of Jesus' teaching, it's also explaining that, that the stories he's talking about, the parables, are the experiences that the Israelites experienced. You have forgotten what it's you have forgotten the wonders that I did for you. You have forgotten the story, the miracles of coming out of Egypt, of the parting of the Red Sea, of being fed miraculously. These stories. You have forgotten them. And I am telling you and reminding you of those stories. You see, ultimately, we will succeed in our faith with Christ, first and foremost, because of what Jesus did on the cross. And second, is that we know the story that God's telling us in our own life. We call it, in Christianese, a testimony. This is what God is doing. This is the point of what He's doing in my life. I am grateful and I'm remembering this right now. And then that's an expression of Revelation chapter 12. In the end, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me. What is the story that God is telling you in your life right now? What is it? What is the point? What is the kingdom principle he's trying to communicate to you. Because whether you perceive it or not, the Lord is talking. That's what he does. I, I'm going to stop right there. Because I'm going to pray for a pray, say a prayer. And I, if some of you are willing to respond to this prayer, so I'm going to ask you to bow your head just for a moment. Just for privacy. And, and I'm going to ask any prayer partners that I have some of them come forward if they would please there will be some people up here in a moment as I'm sharing this with you some of you are going I have no idea what my story is right now you can know that and I'm grateful that you would know that that you're going to have you're going to have to ask. You're going to have to see. The Lord loves you, and He has forgiven you. That is not in question. The question is, are you listening? And so, with no one looking around, private home, you can say, Pastor Mike, I don't know, and I want to know. No one look, just you and me and the Lord. Just slip your hand. I see your hands across the room. That's the hand. Don't do it now. Lord, you see those hands. I just speak a blessing right now, Lord, that you, that, 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 
just as you said, let there be light in Genesis chapter. So let there be light for your life that they may perceive what you are saying to them in their life right now. And as we move forward in the coming weeks and looking at your stories, Jesus, your parables, Lord, show us what's the point? What's the kingdom truth? Show us that. May it bring freedom in this room in a new measure. Your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you would please stand with me, if you would. Just encourage you that uh, if you would like prayer, there are people up here that would love to pray with you. It's a beautiful day outside right now. I mean, we're just having a stunning you know what? Forget what happened yesterday. As hard as it, just leave yesterday. And don't think about tomorrow. Just enjoy and rest in today. I just, just rest in today. God bless you. Have a great week. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. And know the Lord is talking. Proceed. Amen.